Good morning. It is uh, great to, to see you. As uh, Jamie mentioned earlier, uh, continue to pray for Austin and Anita as they're at camp. I understand they're having a, a really good time, but pray for Seth, uh, Anita's husband, because she left the kids here. So continue to pray for, for him if you see him, and he looks like he, you know, deer in the headlights. Uh, you'll, know, you'll know why that is. Now, uh, whenever I go to the beach, uh, there are certain things that I like to do. I like to read. Obviously, I like to eat. I like to listen to the waves roll in. And sometimes if I really push myself, I can do all three of those things multiple times in the course of a single day. So that's kind of the way I like to spend my time. But in recent years, since I've had children, there are some other things that have been added to the vacation routine. Things like throwing the football or the frisbee, uh, putt-putt golf, multiple trips to the nearest ice cream stand. Uh, and then something else that Cannon and I have gotten into since he's gotten a little older is we, we try at least once during the week to build some sort of a sandcastle. Now, to be honest, our designs are not all that sophisticated and they don't take very long to build, but I wanted to show you a picture uh, that's kind of representative of what we do. Now, I'm not sure you could call that a sandcastle. It's kind of more like sand silos, you know, uh, but that's kind of what we do. And it doesn't take very long, but we can call it a sandcastle. When you've got kids, you know, you, you'll do the best you can. Uh, now, it's my understanding, though, that there are other people who take this a bit more seriously. So I've got another picture that you're likely to see if you go to the beach this summer. And obviously, that requires a little more forethought, a little more effort than what Cannon and I uh, usually put forth. Now, I have another picture I want to show you. Uh, this past week, I read an article about the guy you see on the screen. His name is Dylan Mulligan. He lives down in St. Simons Island in Georgia, and he's known as the Georgia Sandman. Now, during the day, he works as a highly successful uh, real estate attorney, but at night and on the weekends, he loves to travel up and down the coast and build these just incredible sandcastles. The one you see on the screen, some of you immediately recognized it, is a replica to scale of the High Clare Castle, which was made famous by the show uh, Downton Abbey. And he told a reporter it took seven hours to build and over 100 gallons of water. Just incredible when you look at the detail. Now, I've got one more that he did that I thought was especially appropriate uh, for a weekend like this weekend, all of us celebrating Independence Day. But in an interview with a reporter about the, the High Clare Castle, when she asked him about the, the elephant in the room when it comes to, to building sandcastles, and that's the fact that no matter how intricate the design, no matter how long it takes you to build, uh, at the conclusion of the project, usually within just a couple hours, the tide is going to come in, and it's going to erase any evidence at all that there was ever something there to start with. So in response to that question, Mr. Mulligan explained that when he first began building sandcastles, it always bothered him. He was spending so much time, so many hours of his life building something so temporary. But then he said this, then I learned that nothing on earth is permanent especially if you're building on sand. When I started making that biblical analogy, it changed my outlook. I've come to the point now when I build it, I just enjoy it. I know the tide is going to destroy it. There's no point trying to protect worldly things. See, the one thing that every sandcastle has in common is it doesn't matter if it takes seven hours to build or 30 seconds at the end of the day, all of them are going to be destroyed. They're all going to be washed away because sandcastles, by their very nature, were never meant to be permanent. They were always meant to be temporary. Now, if you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. This morning, we're kicking off a new series that we're calling Sandcastles, and we're going to talk about some other things that are incredibly temporary and yet demand the majority of our attention. And you know this, the fact is most of the stuff that, that we spend our lives worrying about, the things that, that dominate our thinking from the time we get up in the morning and as we toss and turn through the night are completely 
temporary. The things we worry about, the projects we're trying to complete, the empires that we're trying to build. So that's why I wanted to start today by talking about something that a lot of us struggle with. And part of the reason we struggle is because over time we've allowed ourselves to become hyper-focused on the wrong things. So to help us choose a better way, we're going to look at a famous passage of Scripture that's part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you haven't read it in a while, what Jesus does throughout this sermon is he he talks about how, how different our lives will look if instead of adopting the values of the world around us, we instead adopted the values of his kingdom rather than these earthly kingdoms. Then he goes through and he applies that reasoning to several different areas of our lives. And we're going to start today by looking at one that all of us struggle with, and that's the area of worry. What's interesting, though, is if you look at Matthew 6, is that just before he begins talking about worry, he takes a minute and he talks about the one thing that almost everybody I know worries about, and that's money. There are three categories of people, when you really boil it down, there are three categories of people that worry about money. The first category of people that worry about money are poor people. They worry about not having enough money. Another category of people that worry about money are rich people. Now, as a disclaimer, most people don't think they're rich. In fact, multiple surveys have shown that the average person thinks that anybody that makes twice what they make in the course of a year is a rich person. Doesn't matter if they make $20,000 a year or $2 million a year. Everybody thinks if I just made twice what I make now, then I would be a rich person. But, but what do rich people worry about? They worry about losing money. And then there's this group of people in the middle, we would call them, you know, middle class people, and they also worry about money. They worry about trying to get more money so that they can keep up with the rich people. They also worry about losing the money they have and becoming one of the poor people. So who worries about money? Everybody worries about money. A recent survey by the financial services company Bankrate found that 72% of Americans admit to feeling stressed about money and worried about their financial future. It's really no wonder. You think about all the negative headlines that dominate the 24-hour news cycle. Just listen to some of these from the last couple weeks. Inflation rises 8.6% in May, matching 40-year high. Gas prices hit all-time national high. U.S. consumers contend with double-digit increases at grocery. Economists warn U.S. is already in a recession. Job cuts are rolling in as recession fears rise. Bitcoin prices plummet with no end in sight. S&P 500 on track for worst start to a year since 1970. Retirement accounts lose trillions in stock rut. Now, it doesn't matter. Every time you turn on the news, every time you open the newspaper, you get on your phone, you scroll through the headlines, that's the kind of stuff you see. And so even if you're not already a person that's prone to worry about money, it's enough to at least cause you to to think twice. That's why what Jesus said here in Matthew 6 is so important. In verse 24, he kind of summarizes his approach to money. Then when you get to verse 25, he lays out a principle that he wants to adopt, followed by a list of real-life examples that are meant to drive home his point. If you have your Bible open, verse 24, Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And then he asks this question. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Now, as you look at this, there are four sort of broad principles that Jesus talks about that can help us do a better job at winning this battle over worry. So if you want to keep track, there's a spot in your bulletin or there's a spot on the, the app on your phone. So, so here's the first one. Jesus talks about choosing a better way and he says it starts with recognizing the problem. Now, 
I want you to imagine that, that I handed you a piece of paper, and I said, I want you to make a list of the things that you worry about. The, you know, not all of them, but the top four or five, maybe six things that, that you really worry about on a consistent basis. What would be on your list? Now, as you look at, at where Jesus is preaching this sermon, this first century audience, the things that, that they worried about are the kinds of things that Jesus listed here. You know, what am I going to eat? Am I going to have enough to eat? Where are we going to live? Are we going to have a roof over our head? Uh, what am I going to wear? I mean, in that culture, uh, the clothes were meant to be more functional than fashionable, so clothing was always an issue. But, but on your list, it probably looks different. I mean, you probably don't worry about those types of things. But, but I was thinking about this, and it occurred to me that a lot of the things that, that it would at least would be on my list, and probably the things that would be on your list are things that if they were to go bad would cause you to worry about the things that Jesus listed here. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We worry about questions like, what if I lose my job and I can't afford to feed my kids? Or what if the stock market crashes and I lose all my retirement savings? How am I going to, to find a job at my age? What if inflation continues to rise and I can't afford to pay both the mortgage and my child's tuition to the school that they really want to go to? What if we can't afford the house we just bought? What if the, my car gets repossessed? What if the, the price of my prescriptions continues to rise? What if I can't afford, you know, the big, big family vacation or the, the big family Christmas that everybody expects? Or what about this one? What if my salary gets cut and we have to make some hard decisions about the things that Jesus talked about? What we buy, where we live, what we eat, and what we wear. And so for a lot of us, those are the kinds of questions that, that keep us up at night. And yet, three times in this passage, Jesus says, do not worry. Makes it sound so easy. But you know it's not that easy. The phrase that he uses in Greek means to have a distracted mind or a double mind. To worry about something means to, to dwell on that thing. So make sure you understand, that doesn't mean that you should never be concerned. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan ahead. But it does mean that you shouldn't obsess over things that are most likely out of your control anyway. One writer explained it like this. He said, the essence of worry is an attempt to find your ultimate hope, comfort, security, and meaning in something that's temporal and fleeting. So how do you stop? Jesus just says, hey, don't worry. And you know it's not that easy. It's kind of like, you know, you tell your kids, hey, I want you to go to sleep. And they say, well, I'm not tired. You say, well, go to sleep anyway. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't normally work too well. And so when Jesus says, don't worry, there has to be more to this. And depending on your situation, it might be harder for you than for other people. So to help us process this, Jesus follows it up with a question at the end of verse 25. That's a really important question when he says, what is your life? And Jesus knew that the reason most of us worry is because of misplaced values. The reason we worry is because we're hyper-focused on the wrong things. And so to demonstrate the absurdity of that, he asked the question, what is your life? And then he follows it up with some possible answers. Is not your life more than food? And is not the body more then close. And if you were to apply that, that same question to the things that are on your list of worries, it might go something like this. What is your life? Is not life more than your job? Is not life more than your 401k or the amount of money you have deposited in the bank? Is not your life more than the number of acres you own, the kind of car you drive, the size of your house, the school you go to, your win-loss record, where you go on vacation, what you wear, what restaurants you eat in. I mean, when you put it like that, you instinctively know that Jesus is right. Of course your life is more than those things. It's more than your job. It's more than your retirement account. It's more than where you live or what you drive or what kind of clothes you wear. It's, it's more than, than all of that. The problem is that we forget and we start to obsess over things that are really not all that important. Now, it's not that they're unimportant. It's just that they're not the most important. It's at that point that Jesus says something that almost sounds insensitive when he says, 
Just look at the birds. Now, if you're like me, I don't spend much time looking at birds. I mean, like, unless one hits your windshield or gets in your house, I'm not, I'm not fooling, wasting my time looking at birds. But there are some other things I look at, and you've probably got a list of things that, that you look at on a regular basis that are not birds that you think are more important than birds. So, for example, when I'm at work, you know what I look at? The attendance numbers, the offering numbers, how much money's left on the building debt. And then when I leave work and I go home, I look at the grocery prices and the gas prices. Every once in a while, I look to see how my retirement account is doing and how many bills have piled up on the counter that I have to pay. I mean, those are the things that, that I spend my time looking at. I don't look at birds, but Jesus said, maybe I should spend some time looking at the birds, and, and maybe you should too, because every time you look at the birds, it should be a reminder that even though they don't have a 401k or health insurance or even a paycheck, God watches over them, and if he watches over them, He's promised to watch over you. Now, here's the second step in choosing a better way, and that's that you adopt an eternal perspective. Check out what he says in verse 28. Jesus says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and is tomorrow thrown into the fire will he not much more clothe you you of little faith so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need so i said earlier almost everything that's on your list of worries is most likely something that's temporary and Jesus compares them to the flowers or the field or for our series you could compare them to to sand castles I mean they're literally here today and they're gone tomorrow so the business is going to eventually close your house is eventually going to fall in or be torn down and replaced the farm is going to be sold your your records are going to be broken the people that you work with are going to forget about you and your bank account is eventually going to be empty. And if you talk to somebody who's been through all that, they will tell you that that's going to happen much quicker than you anticipate because that's just how it works. I've got a picture I want to show you. Um, The guy you see on the screen is 90 90 years old. His name is Chuck Feeney. Now, you've probably never heard of him, and that's by design, but the famous investor, Warren Buffett, recently said that Chuck Feeney is his financial role model, which is high praise considering Warren Buffett's one of the richest people in the world. Back in 1960, he and a business partner named Robert Miller founded a company called Duty Free Shoppers. It's kind of the the parent organization that owns a lot of these shops that you see in airports all over the world. Almost immediately, the idea took off, and so from 1960 until he sold his part of the company in 2012, Mr. Feeney made not just millions, but billions of dollars. It's hard to wrap your mind around how much money he actually made. It was in the mid-90s, though, that he and his wife decided that they were going to give it all away. And not just like when they died, like most people do, they made a conscious decision that instead of waiting until they were dead, they were going to give it all away while they were still alive. They started a program called the Giving While Living Program, and to help achieve their goal, they started a foundation which at its height had over 300 employees and 10 global offices and was focused exclusively on how to give his money away. Can you imagine having that much money that you had to have 300 people try to help you figure out how to dispose of it? One of the things that separated Mr. Feeney, though, from other famous philanthropists that you've heard of is the extreme lengths to which he went to make sure that his giving remained 
anonymous. Forbes magazine called him the James Bond of philanthropy. So if you look around the world, there's no buildings with his names on them. There's no endowments at any universities, no nonprofits named after him. Everything was done in secret. And even today, the only reason people know his name is because a couple years ago, Warren Buffett outed him in a magazine interview and talked about him and tried to use him as an example of somebody that we all should emulate. Now listen to this. From the mid-1990s until September of 2020, all right, from the mid-1990s until September of 2020, he and his wife gave away a total of just over $8 billion to various charities, universities, nonprofits, and foundations. When it was all said and done, they got down to their last $1 million dollars sold everything they had, put the million dollars in a retirement account, and moved into a one-bedroom apartment in San Francisco. And the people who know him, who are friends with him, describe this apartment as something closer to a college dorm room than what most people think about when they think about a one-bedroom apartment in California. When it was all said and done, if you do the math, during the final third of his life, Mr. Feeney gave away 375,000% more money than his current net worth. Think about that. Most of us, we struggle like to give away 10%. This guy gave away 375,000% more money than his current net worth. Now, the question is, why would anybody do that? I mean, why would, you, why would you spend your life building up this empire only to give it all away? And the answer is, you're going to do the same thing. You might not have as much as he had, and if you do, I'd love to talk to you, but, but I mean, you're going to do the same thing. The only uncertainty is if it's going to happen after you die or before you die. But the point is, when it's all said and done, you're going to give away everything you have. Because that's how it works. Because you can't take it with you. So you're going to give it away. It's just a matter if you do it before you die or somebody else administers it after you die. And so rather than spending our lives obsessing over stuff that we can't take with us anyway, it only makes sense that we would shift our focus to the things that truly matter. That's why in Colossians 3, the apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because earthly things are temporary and the things above are eternal. So with that in mind, here's the the third step in this process of choosing a better way, it's where you, you actually begin to realign your priorities. So you get to verse 33. Jesus invites us to, to redirect our devotion away from the things of this world and instead refocus our lives on pursuing the things of God. So here's what he says in verse 33. But, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, talk about all the other stuff we worry about, will be given to you as well. So what Jesus is doing here is he's inviting us to live in such a way that we start to put God's kingdom before our kingdom. It's where we start to put building his kingdom before building our own personal kingdoms. It's an invitation for us to surrender our lives to him. And here's a really incredible part. He promises that if we'll do that, he'll take care of all the rest of the stuff. That means that rather than staying up all night and tossing and turning and worrying about things that are completely out of my control anyway, I can go to sleep because he's in charge. It also frees you to spend your days pursuing the things that are going to make an eternal difference. So earlier in Matthew 6, Jesus said it this way. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So what are those treasures in heaven? Well, there's a lot of them. They're the prayers you offer, the 
people you invest in, the kids you teach, the money you give away, the, the widows and orphans that you care for, the prisoners that you visit. It's those times when you weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. And most of all, it's the people that you lead to know Jesus Christ. Now, to be clear, those are not the types of things that are going to increase your net worth. I mean, it's not like you can do all those things and, and watch your portfolio expand and your net worth climb to, to new heights. In fact, most of the things that he talks about are things that will wind up costing you a little something in terms of time and energy and even money. And yet Jesus said over and over again, those are the types of long-term investments that you should be making because those are the only types of investments that are going to matter when it's all said and done. But to do that, you're going to have to let go of some good things so that you can focus on the best things. Now, here's the last thing. The fourth step is to practice the art of living in the present. David quoted it earlier, verse 34, this passage. Here's what it says. Therefore, kind of the conclusion to this, this whole section. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own and notice what he doesn't say he doesn't say that if you follow him there'll be no trouble in fact it's the opposite of that he says the trouble will come the relationship problems the health issues the financial pressure it's all part of the story when you live in a, a fallen world but there's there's nothing you can do about that but what you can do is learn to live in such a way that you don't allow those things to consume you or to dominate your thinking now in your mind i want you to go back to that list of worries, the four or five or six things that, that really mess with you, things that keep you up at night, the things that distract you during the day, you'll find yourself like doing one thing and then you keep, you keep coming back to whatever it is that's weighing heavy on you. I'm willing to bet if you think through each of those issues, you really drill down that each of them will fall into one of two broad categories. There might be a few rare exceptions, but, but most of them will fall into one of these two categories. The first category are things from the past that you can't change. Decisions you made, relationships you ended, opportunities you squandered, you know, career opportunities that you didn't take that you wish you had, or maybe there are opportunities that you did take that you wish you hadn't, financial decisions that maybe you're still paying the, the penalty for. I mean, as you look back over your life, we, we've all got this, this long list of things that if we had the opportunity, we would do things different. We would try to undo some things. But, but what's so crazy about that is that even though we know they're in the past, even though we know there's not one thing we can do to change them, we still worry about them. Now, here's the other category. Things from the future, these potential troubles in the future that we can't control. Now again, don't misunderstand. There are things that you may face in the future that you should be prepared for, that you should plan for. And uh, you, read through, you read through the Proverbs, Solomon over and over again talks about the wisdom of preparing for the future. It's why you go to the doctor. It's why you save money. It's, try, it's why you try to make good decisions so you don't wreck your future. But even when you do everything right, I mean, even when you do everything that you're supposed to do, there is still a huge percentage of the future that's completely out of your control. Nothing you can do about it. And so what Jesus is saying here is that as followers of him, it's critical that we not allow the mistakes of the past or the uncertainty of the future to hold us hostage. And instead, we should learn to put our focus on today i can't change yesterday don't know what's coming tomorrow but what i can do is put my focus on today and focus on the things that really matter and not allow myself to get obsessed with stuff that is completely temporary i have one more picture i want to show you <clears throat> this is uh dylan mulligan again uh, in one of the interviews I read earlier this week, most of what he builds are replicas of churches, famous churches from around the world. He's a Christian. He sees his art as a way of honoring God. So that's what he 
primarily focuses on, but, but sometimes he will do replicas of buildings that have been an important part of his story or that are significant to the state of Georgia where he's from. And this one happens to fit both of those. This is a replica of the main building of the law school at the University of Georgia where he attended. And this was done uh, near Savannah. So newspaper picked up with this and the Savannah Morning News sent a reporter out to interview him. And, and to be honest, most of the questions were kind of a carbon copy of other interviews that he had done in his career. They asked him things like, how'd you get started? How long does it take? How many do you build? And, and on and on like that. And then towards the, inter- uh, the end of this interview, this reporter asked him pretty much the, the same question that the other reporter asked him. And she asked him about, you know, how does it feel working on something that you know is the tide is going to come in and take back? And this time in his, in his answer, he said essentially the same thing, but he was a, a bit more expansive. And I wanted, to, I, wanted you to, I wanted to share this with you. Listen to what he said. I reconciled myself to that a long time ago. When I was young and first started building, that was something that I dwelled on all the time, and it made me crazy trying to stop the tide. One time when I was 10 or 11, some cousins and I were working on a castle, and the tide was coming in, so we put up a massive seawall all the way around the castle trying to prevent the tide from coming in, and we did a pretty good job. We held it off for a while but you're not going to beat the tide. Then he said this. He said, I came to the realization a long time ago that nothing on this earth is permanent, especially when you build it out of sand. It's a natural cycle. When you build something like this, part of that process and part of that cycle is seeing it go back to what you made it out of, the sand itself. There's an old saying that I always try to remember, time and tide wait for no man. Jesus said the same thing when he asked the question. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the answer is no. You can't even add a single second to your life. But here's what you can do. You can redirect your life in such a way that rather than spending all of your time building an empire made of sand that the tides of time will one day wash away, you can instead spend your earthly life preparing for your eternal life. I want you to stand with me. Whenever you talk about something like this, you have people who approach these issues from drastically different places. Some of you really are facing some heavy financial challenges and it's it's up to you to figure out how to make all the pieces fit and i just want you to know if that's your situation without downplaying the severity of it in any way i want you to know you're not on your own you have a heavenly father who's promised to help you see through your see your way through it if you'll just continue to trust him others of you here this morning are in a different situation though your bills are paid um your financial future is secure at least as much as it can be secured and now you're wondering if that's all there is it's like you built the castle you secured the borders and you put this wall around it and you keep trying to add to the walls so that everything will be protected and we're going to talk more about that in coming weeks but but if that describes your situation you, you need to know that no matter how big the castle no matter how big the walls eventually the tide always wins. So don't put your trust in something that's so temporary. Instead, put your trust in Jesus. So we close this morning. We're going to sing a couple songs. And as we do, if you're here and you need to pray with somebody, you want to talk with somebody, you're unsure what your next step should look like, uh, David and I would be honored to talk with you. All you need to do during the course of these two songs is just come and, and hang out on this front row. Maybe you're here and you've not taken care of the most pressing issue. Maybe you spent all your life preparing and building up your earthly life and you've not made your reservation for eternal life. We'd love to talk you through that process. Uh, You may be here and you're ready to join the team. We had a young couple uh, join the team in the first service this morning. If you have questions about any of that, 
Dave and I are here to help you. You just come and, and meet with us.